everybody. Well, why don't we get uh, tonight started? Um, for those here in the room, welcome. It's good to see everyone. For those on Zoom, thank you for tuning in. Um, welcome to the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. Of course, as always, I am your host, Eric Story, I'm the Outreach Manager here at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada, uh, as well as a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wolford Laurier University. Now, before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge that the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada is located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and we recognize the continuing presence of Indigenous peoples and cultures here. The consequences of the long colonial relationship between the Government of Canada and First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples are far-reaching and painful. We are committed to reconciliation through the establishment and maintenance of a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Before I turn things over to our speaker tonight, um, some of you in this room, hopefully on Zoom as well, perhaps have attended a few of these events before. Um, and the director, uh, Kevin Spooner, has, I think he's spoken to this, but it's been quite some time. And I just wanted to remind folks um, for those here in the room, you can see that sign right to your right, uh, the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada sign. And for those who are on Zoom, you can check out on our website. But I wanted to speak to those kind of four different colors on the poster there. I kind of see them as almost like mid, kind of like mini Pac-Men sort of thing. That's, that's what I imagine when I see them every time. Um, but each of the four colors, they signify the collective, the research collective that represent uh, what the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada uh, strives towards. Um, and so I'll, I'll just tell you each of them briefly. Uh, blue is policy connections. Um, green is war in society, often through our legacy programming, uh, through which that kind of research collective functions. Um, and then we've got the orange color, um, that's publics and social justice. And then finally, we've got the yellow um, sector, um, and that's communities, local communities here in Waterloo, and of course at Brantford. And I feel like that collective we don't doesn't get this appreciation that I think it deserves. And so I really wanted to bring in a speaker today, tonight, who could speak to that collective. And that's exactly why I invited Dr. Christina Hahn here. Um, Christina Hahn, she's our speaker. She's Associate Professor of Asian History at Wolford Laurier University, Brantford Campus, a curator and digital humanist. Since 2019, she has been involved in deep mapping projects on Brantford's immigration history, and she is currently serving as the president of the Canadian Industrial Heritage Centre in Brantford. And tonight, she's going to be speaking on the early immigrant histories uh, to the city of Brantford in the early 20th century between 1900 and 1920. So could you please put your hands together for our speaker tonight, Dr. Christina Hahn. I hope the mic is working. Awesome. This is my first lecture here at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. And I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. As you can see, the title of my talk today is Time Travel to Brantford, 1900 to 1920, Telling Brantford's Early Immigrant Stories. How many of you have been to Brantford? Raise your hand. Okay. Downtown Brantford? Raise your hand. What do you think of downtown Brantford? <laughs> oh, people are laughing. Uh, I have two goals for my lecture tonight. One is to change the way you think about downtown Brantford. Two uh, is to uh, make you hungry. So you'll feel very hungry by the end of today's lecture. As the poster uh, for our student exhibit, by the way, we have two students who actually did this event. I, I didn't know they were coming today. So it's very wonderful to see you tonight. Um, student exhibit, which happened last semester called Flashback Downtown Brantford. And the poster says, think you know downtown Brantford? Think again. Before we get to our topic tonight, I first want to talk a little bit about myself as, um, I hope this works, okay. As Eric introduced, I'm a cultural historian of East Asia and a curator of East Asian art, 
I have been working and affiliated uh, with working at and affiliated with the WAM since 2004. So it's been a very long time. My uh, latest project at the ROM is uh, the audio guide tour. I, I served as a producer for, for this, and this happened during COVID, which was very, very interesting. My latest exhibit, uh, this happened, the opening was in, well, yeah, just like two weeks ago. Uh, this is in Ottawa. Uh, first encounter, Colorful Korea by Tisan, looking at export paintings from Korea. Paintings that came to Korea, uh, to Canada, and introduced Korea for the first time to uh, Canadians back in the late 19th century. Now to Brantford. I moved from Toronto to Brantford in 2013. Brantford was a whole new city to me. I didn't know much about it at all. Brantford. And, and then after, after living there for a few years, I learned that Brentford used to be a key industrial city in Canada back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Did you know that Brentford was the number one exporter of agricultural machinery in the British Empire in the late 19th century? Right. And by 1900, Brentford became Canada's third largest industrial city. Lots of entrepreneurs and inventors were drawn to the city. And that's why Alexander Graham Bell's family moved there. And there were things to do there. Many workers also came to Brantford to find jobs. There were lots and lots of jobs in Brantford. As the poster says, Brantford was Canada's city of industry. Many companies actively recruited workers from other countries such as the Cockshot Plow Company. They recruited Armenian workers to come to Brantford to work in their factory. As a result, creating the largest Armenian community in the world outside of Armenia well, back in the days. And these plows were sold all around the world and opened up the prairies in Canada. When I moved to Brantford, I found the city to be very white not multicultural at all. But I learned it was not the case before. How industrial machinery were immigrants from all around the world who made Brantford one of the most multicultural cities in Canada in the early 20th century, with the largest proportion of foreign-born residents in the country. Take a look at this article from 1927. Brantford Expositor. It says a Chinese bride will make her home in Brantford. Um, and they did a special feature uh, on this. When I moved to Brantford in 2013, there was no article on the Expositor for me that says a Korean professor yeah. is moving to Brantford. Since 2019, I have been trying to capture the diverse and complex histories of the city and its people. My first project on Brantford's immigration history was a project led by my student. And uh, Cassie here was part of that. I had my third year students in a public history uh, course to research the history of Brantford's various immigrant uh, communities and create an exhibit. And the result was Brantford, Our Immigrant Stories. It was a hugely successful event. And that was the website that they created. Then together with a group of local historians and community partners, we created the Memories of Brantford's, uh, or the Memories of Brantford project, which uh, explores and celebrates the history of immigration in Brantford. The first community we looked at was the Jewish community, the second one, Italian, uh, the latest one, the third one is the Chinese community. And I did the exhibit for this called Laundry's Chopsticks Medicine, it's on until March 22nd. If you are in Brantford, I highly recommend you to go and take a look at it. It's a fascinating exhibit. In 2020, I got a grant from Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada to study Brantford's early immigration history and create a database for an interactive map. And that is the official title of my uh, research or project, 
comparative spatial histories of Vancouver's early immigrant communities. Deep mapping and digital storytelling project. This project investigates spatial histories of three communities, Armenian, Italian, and Chinese. In case you don't know what a deep map is, it's literally a um, map with multiple layers of information. So based on the data drawn from census and city records, local newspaper and archival materials, and information uh, that we gathered from community members, we just completed creating a deep map, which I'll show you, uh, that visualizes how these three communities with distinct immigration patterns developed over the course of two decades. The software I, I used is called Curist. It is a web-based database and mapping interface designed for humanities research. So we also have a website that is uh, integrated into the database. Um, I'm going to introduce that to you right now. That is um, that's the homepage. It's me. Brief intro about my uh, project. My two beautiful research assistants, uh, Lauren and Nicole. And this is what the map looks like. The base map was built from fire insurance maps of Brantford. And essentially, it's a large database with a lot of information. The map shows where people lived, where they worked, uh, their relationships, uh, sites of significant events, and much more. I am focusing on the first two decades of the 20th century, the period that saw the first large influx of immigrant workers to Brantford into Brantford. By 1907, the city identified the growing presence of these foreigners as an important economic, social, and cultural issue to be dealt with. And after much public debate, a number of services were introduced to help assimilate the foreigners in the city uh, to Canadian life. And using my database, which is uh, open access, anyone can uh, use it, you can learn about Brantford's early immigrant communities from this map. The left column shows the various filters that you could uh, apply. It says uh, Armenian, Chinese, Italian. It shows uh, whether people are married, uh, single or widowed, their religion, uh, level of education, occupation, etc. This is a screenshot of where Armenians uh, lived. Chinese and Italian. So take a look at this particular image. What is that in the center? Where were Italians living? What do you see there? Railroad, thank you very much. Grand Trunk Railway and a lot of Italians in Brantford, they were railway workers. That's why they lived around that area. If you apply uh, the filter, uh, you could also see um, the religions that these early immigrants had. This shows that 43 members of Chinese community in Brantford identify themselves as Confucians, okay. 71 as Presbyterians. Surprise, right? The database also includes business ads, newspaper articles, as well as story map highlighting notable features and their not notable figures and their stories. By the end of World War I, Brantford was home to over 3,000 immigrants from 34 countries and roughly 500 Armenians, 160 Italians, and 110 Chinese were living in Brantford. The Armenians were mostly industrial workers who were actively recruited by the city's major manufacturer, the Kokshaw Plow Company. Um, Armenian workers initially saw themselves just coming to the city, working for some years, save enough money and go back to Armenia. But with the outbreak of World War I and the ensuing Armenian genocide, they decided to settle in the city. Italians came to Brantford to work in construction and foundry and to build railroads. 
the community that started, started with two families in 1903 grew steadily. And in 1914, the first Italian grocery store was established in Brantford. The Chinese are the most understudied community of the three. The early Chinese residents of Brantford were manual laborers and entrepreneurs who appear to have moved to the city after working in railway construction and mining elsewhere. So why did I pick these three communities? I have selected these three communities in order to shed light on the multiplicities of immigrant experiences in the city. Now, um, I'm gonna tell you lots of interesting stories. I want to share with you some interesting stories that I found about the two lesser known communities because I only have an hour, <laughs> Armenians and Chinese. So if you're Italian, I am sorry. <laughs> you can uh, talk to me afterwards. Early Canadian oral history reveals that a member of the Cockshot family, owners of the Cockshot Plow Company in Brantford, went to Constantinople in the 1880s and recruited 10 Armenian workers. And soon other Armenians began arriving in the city in search for employment. Brentfordians showed great concern for um, Armenians during the Armenian massacre in, uh, in Turkey. There we go. Oh, did I miss? There we go, yes. It says, right, uh, Armenians are about to be massacred, therefore, uh, we need to save them. Many began fundraising to help Armenians. Churches contributed to help Armenian Christians, such as Brand Avenue Church, that hosted children's entertainment for the relief of Armenian surfer, surfer uh, Armenians, Armenian people, right, who are suffering in Armenia. Many Armenian or some Armenian students and clergy came to Brantford to give lectures on the terrible massacres in their homeland. Reverend George Fillion was one of those people. He was a refugee and a clergyman, and he gave a lecture uh, in Brantford in 1898. Something I found rather strange was that, according to this article, the lecturer gave graphic descriptions of horrible massacres which transpired recently. What was the audience reaction? The audience were, were delighted. <laughs> that's what that's what the article. They were delighted. Another famous preach Armenian preacher that visited a Brantford um, was Reverend Papazians, and he came to Brantford in 1903. He stayed in the city uh, for over a week, and he went to several uh, locations, churches, um, local gatherings to talk about the massacres back home. Papazians was a well-known advocate for Armenian cause, and I found a New York Times article he wrote in 1901 right, entitled Appeal for Christian Armenia. Besides people, rugs also came from Turkey, and Brentfordians loved them. In 1901, there was the Great Rug Exhibition in Brantford, exhibition of fine oriental rugs purchased from the agents of a large house in Constantinople. Um, apparently, uh, these were very popular items that Brentfordians bought. So good rugs at moderate prices. 1903. Oriental rug auction, Turkish and Persian rugs, East Indian draperies, and Armenian embroidery. And this was to take place at 55 Colborne Street. Where? Right there, right next to Gloria Bramper YMCA. Early Armenians in Brantford had success or had access to education. And this article from 1902 shows that they attended a technical school in Brantford. And the article tells us that their education was paid for by the late Ignatius Cockshot, the owner of the Cockshot Blog Company. 
1906 says, many Armenians are coming, more are coming. 75 will shortly sail in a few weeks to arrive in Brantford in early spring. The article says that these people are relatives of Armenians already working in the city. And the article also says that the majority of Armenians in Brantford have steady work and they're making sufficient income. Of course, not all Armenian workers were treated fairly, and this led to labor strikes. 1903, Armenian painters at the Brantford Carriage Company went on strike, grieving that although they were hired as painters, the company also consigned them to other work. So they walked out. Armenian workers also got into fights with Canadian workers, as this 1904 article shows. Um, it says there are too many fights between local workers and Armenian workers in Brantford. And this happened again at this particular location. There are also lots of injuries and death. This article talks about how an Armenian worker was badly scalded at uh, Watrous Engine Works while working. Armenian had an accident in 1906. It's a short article, so I'll read it. Early last night, an, an Armenian employed at the Malleable Iron Works had a painful accident. He was pouring molten iron and got a splash of it on the top of his hand. The metal burned right in and seared the flesh clean to bone. The injured man had his hand bound up and was able to walk home, accompanied by a companion. He just walked home. Oh, I can't imagine. Sure, they were learning English now. So 1906 article says they're hitching now. So more Armenians are now speaking English which hopefully will improve uh, the situation, right? Um, after learning the English language, did they stop fighting? The answer is no. Uh, more strikes <laughs> and more walkouts happened as a result. So this one uh, talks about um, labor strike that happened in 1906. They were demanding pay raise from $1.50 to $1.75. But not everything was so gloomy. Armenians were generous givers when it came to supporting fellow Canadian workers. And this article talks about how a Canadian person died at work and Armenian workers came together to raise funds to support that family. And uh, there are also some fun stories too. Armenian bakery opened in the city in 1905. Where? That building right there. People don't know. It was a very popular bakery too. One day, um, the owner of the bakery uh, was transporting a lot of bread <laughs> in a carriage and his horse went kind of wild and bread was all over the streets, uh, just outside market, right? And people were just, some people were picking the bread and others were just, just observing, having a grand time. So as the community grew, they came together and decided to buy a house together, right? It saves money. Led to a lot of issues. So this particular house that they try to buy, I think I, uh, yeah, right here. Armenians will build. A number of Armenians have purchased the property on this uh, street, which is right there, from a Canadian person. And they intend to build a larger house on that property and use it as a home for as many of their nationality as they can. Overcrowding was a big issue. This article shows in one house, 30 were living and there were 17 beds and one young pig. I don't know how they managed to squeeze them all together. Um, Hungarians, they were living in one house. 30 Hungarians were living there, only 11 beds. How is that possible? They worked day shift and night shift. 
Right. So that's how they share the house. By 1911, complaints against expanding foreign community was heard, especially against houses owned by foreign workers. And local residents of Eagle Place complained, proposing segregation of foreigners. Soon, the proposal was presented at the city council. This was on June 13, 1911. There was a lot of discussion, uh, making it short, what happened. Um, many people in Brantford thought segregation was a terrible idea, including uh, Brantford pastor, um, Dr. Scott, who responded in this letter that instead of segregating, segregation won't solve the problem. Instead, the locals should cooperate to aid in improving living conditions of foreigners in Brantford and assist them so they can be good citizens. And eventually, the city decided that segregation was not possible and was not desirable. I think it's important to note that the Armenians in Brantford did not get along with the Turks in the city. <laughs> uh, 1912, there was a riot in Brantford between uh, Turks and Armenians, and they were working in the same factory. There were over 25 of them employed at the work. And one morning, they suddenly decided to settle their differences. They took the handles out of their pickaxes and set upon each other, fighting until both sides were satisfied. And um, no serious injuries were reported. <laughs> During the First World War, uh, Armenians also trained to uh, go and fight in uh, World War I. They drilled to uh, fight in World War I. I don't know if you knew, but some Turks uh, were interned in Brantford, a uh, precautionary measure. And when Turks were being interned, Armenians did not object. A photo of uh, Armenian refugees who were saved from Turks. I hope you're having fun. Now to the Chinese. So uh, this is a census record that shows how many um, foreigners were in the city. Plains from some people. We learned that foreigners in Brantford were law-abiding citizens. There was a great hype about violent Italians and Armenians, drunken Italians stabbing people on the streets. But this police report shows that in 1912, there were only 14 arrests of Armenians, two arrests of Italian, zero Chinese, and 628 arrests of Canadians. So um, we see who were the violent people. <laughs> now to the Chinese. I'm doing well. The earliest record of Chinese in Brantford that I came across comes from 1884, an expositor article that says there was a Chinese drama troupe consisting of over 30 celestials. That's how they call the Chinese people back then. They were performing in Brantford. I was thrilled. I was really excited when I saw this article. But then it turns out that the Chinese drama troupe in Brantford, well, well the performers were not Chinese, but rather, <laughs> Uh, the alumni of Young Ladies College who created a show which they called a spectacle of true celestial life. This and many other sources I found tell us that before any Chinese person arrived in the city, people of Brantford were exposed to Orientalist and often negative representations of Chinese people, viewing them as exotic others or as threats. Stories of early, oh, sorry, why is it moving? Stories of early Chinatowns in San Francisco and New York fill the expositor. Mount Hope Cemetery in Brantford uh, was where foreigners were buried. And I found the two tombstones of E.W. and H.W. E.W. 
was buried in 1876 and H.W. 1877. According to the cemetery registry, they were Orientals. The earliest documented reference to a Chinese person, a real Chinese person in Brantford comes from July 8, 1885. His name was Lilette. Lilette came from Hamilton to set up a laundry and an expositor art of, uh, reporter interviewed him. The Chinese man told the reporter that he liked Canada and did not want to live in the US. Lee told the reporter that he wanted to find a nice towel and do a good laundry business. Said Lee, the reporter describes Lee as a celestial giggling in an idiotic manner. Lee set up a laundry business on Nelson Street, but only after two weeks, he packed up and left the city. The newspaper tells us that sometime Saturday evening, someone threw a stone through his front window. Brantford boys had so persistently annoyed him that Lee feared the worst. And he, according to the reporter, Lee made a wise decision to leave the city. So where did Lee go? He left for New York City. In his parting words, he said, Brantford was a bad city. Chinese laundryman. Wait, did I miss here? Here, sorry. Two years later, another Chinese man came to Brantford to set up a laundry on Market Street, and his name was Un Wong. And we don't hear about him again. So why were Chinese men coming to Brantford to set up hand laundries? Chinese migrants in Canada faced greater challenges than their European counterparts due to racism and policies. They set up hand laundries because after they built the Canadian Pacific Railway, they were hired to do domestic labor, white women's job, including washing and cooking. Hand laundries were labor intensive and required little investment. In Vancouver, uh, these laundries first appeared in the West Coast, right? So take a look at this photo of a Chinese laundry in Vancouver from 1884. The first successful Chinese laundry in Brantford belonged to Li Chong, which he bravely called the Chinese laundry. Facing prejudice, Li, on February 4th, 1897, that was only after, I, I think, a week after the business opened, he published a notice to the public asking them to throw prejudices, prejudices to the dogs and try the Chinese laundry for the best work in the city. And this laundry was located at 153 Belusi Street, which is right here. Um, do you know where that place is? Oh my gosh, I don't know why the screen is advancing without my consent. Um, that's the docking area of one market. Yeah, right here across the street from Laurier's Research and Academic Center. That was the location of the first Chinese laundry or Li Chong's Chinese Laundry. So why did Li write such a notice? There were many negative views about the Chinese and Chinese laundry in Canada, as this 1906 expositor article includes. It says, you know, Chinese laundries are menace to health. And this includes criticisms made by the National Laundry Association. We also see the image of Chinese laundrymen that became a caricature and appeared in newspapers, um, like the Chinamen washing clothes. It was a very um, negative image at the time. But despite these criticisms, Chinese laundry in Brentford continued to grow in number because many Brentfordians used their services. And this advertisement from uh, 1920 says, 12 Chinese laundries in Brantford have installed 1,900 cataract electric washers. Why? 
because it's a good electric washer. There were 12 Chinese laundries in downtown in 1920. Many Chinese people later also opened restaurants in Brantford, and this is one of the earliest ones, Boston Chinese Cafe on 47 Colborne. Right there. Used to be there. <laughs> Boston Cafe became a very successful business in Brantford. And did you know that they did not serve Chinese food? All early Chinese operated cafes serve Western food, steak and seafood, and later introduced chop suey. The business was so successful, soon they opened a second location at 113 Colborne Street. That is where Laurier Brantford YMCA is currently located. Unfortunately, we don't have photos of the Boston cafes. Well, we do. That's the front, right? Um, but this article from 1913 gives us a sense of what the restaurant was like and who the owner operator, Dickmar, was like. Dickmar is the man in the center. And he was highlighted as one of the key entrepreneurs in the city in the 1913 Expositor article. It is very long. I will not read it uh, word for word, but um, it was a very elegant, uh, elegantly decorated restaurant with private dining rooms and tea rooms for ladies. So popular has this place become of late that enlargement to size was twice made, twice made necessary recently, right? It was a wonderful um, place where people enjoyed fine dining at a reasonable, reasonable price. The article also says, Dick Marr is an active, energetic, and trustworthy man. He is a good citizen. Quite an accomplishment in 1913. Maybe the interior of the restaurant looked something like this. So this is an um, iconic Port Arthur restaurant in New York City. Chinese cafes back in the days look like this. Beautiful furniture, antique furniture, fine dining. But the beginnings of Chinese cafes in Brantford were not so easy. 1909, when a Chinese and when a local Chinese restaurant owner, Harry Chong, married an Irish girl, Nora O'Laughlin, this became an international sensation. Nora was a young Irish vagrant who had known Harry. She got into trouble. She was arrested by the local police. Harry didn't want her to go to prison, so decided to marry her at the police station. Right. The news blamed, uh, this uh, news is about their marriage, uh, Windsor Star from 1909. And it says, you know, Harry's bad, Nora's bad, the priest or the pastor who married the two there, he's also bad. You know, this is very unnatural. This should not have happened. It should be noted that there was a great deal of discussion about uh, white girls working for and being in a relationship with Chinese men. Any hurtful words were uh, said about white women working at Chinese laundry or Chinese restaurants. And um, this was a very big issue. Why was this the case? I want to share with you the poster of the rise of Fu Manchu. How many of you are familiar with this movie? <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, it's, it's a horror movie about an evil Chinese man. Uh, played by Christopher Lee, who uses magic to seduce and kill white girls. And it, the, the last of these series was released in 1966. So this continued for a really long time. Now, later, more Chinese 
laundries and restaurants were established in Brantford. Some iconic ones include the Patricia Cafe, established in 1919. Can you see where the sign is? Right, Patricia Cafe, located at 113 Belusi Street. And this is where it used to be, again, right on our campus. Henry and Nellie Wong were the owners of the cafe. And we didn't have the images of these early Chinese residents. But when I was working on the exhibit, curator of Brand Museum and Archives, Nathan, who's a good friend of mine, sent me an email. Christina, we found photos of uh, Chinese residents of Brand. We found two Chinese boys and a Chinese woman happen to be, they happen to look like this. That's the glass negative. Ellie, Arthur, and Sam Wong, family that ran the Patricia Cafe in Brampton. The Wongs of the Patricia Cafe were friends of this lady, Evelyn Johnson. You know who Evelyn Johnson is? It's the sister of Pauline Johnson, right? She lived on the second floor apartment of the restaurant. And when she was old, she was broke, she was blind. The Wongs took care of her. And in her will, uh, she left gifts for the Wong family. The Chinese community in Brantford was also actively involved in the Ma in helping the modern republic in China, which was facing a lot of challenges domestically and internationally. I don't know if you knew, but there was the Brantford branch of the Chinese, which was formed in 1919. This 1920 article says that there was a formal inauguration of the Brantford branch of the Chinese Nationalist League. Um, and um, this happened Sunday afternoon when a portrait of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the first president of the new Chinese Republic, was unveiled and addresses were delivered by the president of the Chinese National League of Canada, that's the man right there who came to Brantford from Vancouver for this event. They also invited a lot of honored guests, including Senator Proudfoot, who was a counsel for the league, um, W.G. Raymond and Arthur Hardy. Um, um, they were politicians and judges. And the event happened at the Royal Cafe in Brantford right there, right next to Grand River Hall. And the league's president was Mr. Dick Marr, proprietor of Boston Chinese Cafe, and he gave the welcome speech. We even had the entire menu of banquet for that evening. They didn't serve Western food, they served authentic Chinese food. And do you know, do you want to know what was served? that night. Relishes, including almonds, dried sour plums, lychees, sweet plums, and California oranges. Bird's nest soup with longan. Steamed fillet of fresh fish. Now you're getting hungry. There we go. Uh, braised abalone and rice sponge cake. Braised chestnut chicken. Lohei salad. And oopsies lychee cake, and oolong tea. We didn't know what these members of Brantford's Chinese Nationalist League looked like. When I was working on that exhibit at the museum, uh, Laundries, Chopsticks, and Medicine, two weeks before the opening, someone from London Public Library dropped a box of stuff. There, they just left. Um, box of stuff about Brim. And in that box was this photo. That shows the members of Brimford's Chinese 
Nationalist League. In the center is Dick Marr, president of Rapper Chinese Nationalist League. And we even know his Chinese name now because the names are written in Chinese. I also found some interesting articles about Brantford Police, um, Brantford Police giving Chinese cafes some hard time. For example, in 1917, Brantford Police ordered all Chinese restaurants to remove their draperies, otherwise they will lose their licenses because the police wanted the curtains of individual dining rooms drawn back. Like they thought security concerns, God knows what's happening behind those curtains, you should take them down. In the following year, owners of the Dominion and Royal Cafes received a warning for breaching the food regulations. What food regulations? They served pork. They served pork um, on a Friday morning. Um, so no pork chop, everyone. Friday mornings. The Chinese community in the city continued to grow. Take a look at this ad of Hollywood Cafe from 1929. Um, and that's um, the owner, George Bo. This was a very popular destination in Brantford. They had live music, live orchestra playing every night. And while the menu wasn't very Chinese, Hollywood Cafe also served Chinese food. Um, on a very special day. 1929, July 4th, Hollywood Cafe served Chinese food to Brantford ladies. Intriguing Chinese dishes were enjoyed. And I think it's a very appropriate article um, for us to look at because I'm sure everyone is hungry. The article says, Brantford ladies were very excited to be at this banquet because it was a very special banquet. Um, owner George Bow imported ingredients from China for this uh, very special banquet. And he even there, they even had a special guest of honor, a guest speaker, Dr. Do Hixie, who was teaching history at uh, McMaster. They got him over to um, talk about um, chopsticks, symbol of chopsticks. This chopsticks um, can be seen as uh, a symbol of peace, whereas Western knives and forks, <laughs> they represent war. So on and so on. So all the Brentford ladies had to use chopsticks to eat. And at first, they were kind of awkward. But by the end, they all mastered the use of chopsticks. Fantastic. The menu again, uh, is included. First nut soup, nan king duck, Chinese crystal chicken a la George Bo. I don't know what it looked like, but this was George Bo's signature dish. Uh, braised French mushrooms and dragon's eyes and Chinese mandarins. Oranges and leeches. And real Chinese tea without milk or sugar. And that's exactly how they put it. <laughs> Real Chinese tea without milk or sugar. So Brantford folks came a long way from driving the first Chinese laundryman away to eating authentic Chinese food with chopsticks and also drinking tea without milk and sugar. Last semester, I taught one of Brantford's public history uh, courses, History 240, The Active Historian. And the major part of our coursework was to create a public history event called Flashback Downtown Brantford. 30 students worked very hard, including our two lovely students uh, who are with us tonight. And it was a week long event. We had exhibitions, games, presentations. We had two opening day events attended by 120 people in total. It was an amazing experience. And the event was set up uh, at the lower level of one market building, which you can see right there. 
So we had display bar. So that's the entrance, you know, like, welcome. Okay. People, uh, students set up display boards. They design the program and uh, game pamphlet. They set up um, exhibits, uh, one for each community, Chinese, Armenians, and uh, Italians. So that's the one for uh, the Chinese. Laundry, right? And uh, you see what a Chinese laundry man uh, must have worn. Italian, railway worker, and Armenian and uh, labor strikes. And we see Elise right there uh, in the photo. Oh gosh, we worked so hard. Uh, just setting that board up um, Sunday afternoon. It took us hours to put that canvas uh, on those frames, but it was a lot of fun. We had a game and performance group. So one of the games that they made was Fontan, which was uh, a game that the Chinese community played. Gambling, essentially. That's what it is. Uh, the Chinese uh, residents got into a lot of trouble uh, for playing Fontan. So students taught us how to play, how to gamble, how to play Fontan, and people had a lot of fun. So another game that they designed, um, finding out uh, information about different buildings in downtown Brantford and their hidden histories. Media promotion and community relations team. They also did a lot of work. And they brought in guest speakers for the event, including our very own Joe Beer, Director of Teaching, Learning, and Development. They supported our exhibit because it costs money to do this. We also had uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Liberal Arts give us an opening talk. Vice President of the Canadian Industrial Heritage Center, um, Student Advisor of uh, Florida International, Special Constable, we talked about crime in downtown Brantford, um, and President of Brant Brantford and District Label Council, because a lot of the stories that uh, our exhibit shared was about labor uh, issues. What else? Yes, we also had our online exhibition team and portable exhibition team. So this team designed portable um, exhibition that they took to the public library and high schools in Brantford. Um, they set them up and um, talked to high school students about early in the history of Brantford because even the teachers didn't know. High school history teachers didn't know much about Brantford's early history, and they didn't really teach this in their classes. So this was a very wonderful way to engage uh, the high school students there. And finally, our event design and management team. They all complained to me that they worked so hard. This was a lot of work. Uh, but at the end, students said this was an amazing learning experience. Yeah. Uh, to research, to learn, but also to share with the general public um, what they learned in class. I hope you enjoyed learning about Brantford's fascinating history of immigrant communities. And I'm sure next time you are in downtown Brantford and you pass these buildings right on our campus, you will see Patricia Cafe. You will remember. Nellie, Arthur, and Sam. You'll remember the people, their stories, and their contribution to this wonderful city of Brantford. And downtown Brantford will never look the same. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Han, that was just a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Um, oh, the, the events that we've done here over the years, we tend to look, I think with military history, they just feel very big, right? Is the type of, is, of kind of talks that we give, but these micro histories are just the stories that we get from them. 
um, I find just as fascinating um, and so much more personal, I find, than these big events. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, what we'll do, as, as we usually do um, during the Q&A session, is we'll open up questions to both people here in the room, but also for those who are tuning in on Zoom. Um, for those who are on Zoom, um, just please enter in your question into the Q&A and I will vocalize it to Dr. Hahn here in the room. Um, but before I turn it to the Zoom audience, I want to ask anyone in here um, if they have any questions for Dr. Hahn to start the uh, Q&A session. And before actually um, I get to you, Roger, I see your hand up. Um, my colleague Emily is going to be running the microphone around the room so that people on Zoom can hear the questions that are being asked. So why don't we start with uh, with Roger here with the first question. Hey, thank you, Dr. Han. That was really inspiring. And my question, I guess, is a little bit of a jaded one, and that is, um, what about uh, efforts to preserve the heritage of Brantford? Um, you know, my background is in Halifax, where there have been many uh, worthy projects over the years celebrating Halifax's heritage. And it seems that the developers sort of target um, the historic areas, you know, lately, the, the whole Barrington Street. I'm uh, just wondering what the situation is in Brantford, if you've had any success with preserving some of the uh, heritage buildings and how that comes into the whole equation. Thing. Thank you for that question. Um, the situation is not so good. <laughs> There are new developments just popping up everywhere in Brantford. I don't know if you've been to the city lately. Um, new condo buildings are, are coming up. And um, I don't want to be too critical, <laughs> but um, I think ever since the 1980s, when um, the city's industry went down, um, a lot of People in Brantford um, somehow started distancing themselves from the past because maybe it's a bit too difficult to swallow. But um, as a result, what happened was the, the glorious days, <laughs> the really interesting stories also became forgotten. Um, and um, many people see Brantford as the telephone city or the hockey city, right? Um, so the city has uh, invested a lot of money into sports and, and you know, those areas, but the city is also changing now. Um, more money being given to um, various heritage-related projects. So hopefully things will change, but it's an uphill battle, as you all know. Um, right? Like they want to develop certain areas, but oftentimes. There's heritage uh, structure. Like, what do you do? Um, do you keep that or do you tear it down and build a new condo? But I think through my own research and work, well, a lot of people in the city find it really very fascinating too. Like I did uh, some like, city staff and uh, counselors have come to my talks and seen my exhibits and they were also very surprised and inspired to learn that, oh, Brantford actually has such a vibrant multicultural uh, history. And um, by um, raising awareness, hopefully things will change. Thank you. Um, we got, do you have a question at the back? Hold on, I'll give you the microphone. When I was with Sear Service, I got to Brantford a lot. Now, the last 10 years, I've been going to the Brantford Military Heritage Museum, which right. is really good. Right. There's nothing like that here. Uh, they re redid their exhibits quite a bit during the COVID lockdown and all this stuff. Uh, now, the Germans, there weren't a lot of Germans, I guess, in Brantford in the First World War, like here. We had riots here and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was relatively quiet in Brantford, I guess, in the First World War. Uh and you had your volunteers for the uh, military too. You went overseas, fight for the allies, the good guys, we'll call them. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there was a German community in in Brantford, I think, but most of them came after after the Second World War. I have to verify, but um, not not as big as here, of course. It's Waterloo, Kitchener area. Um, more questions more in the questions. audience. I'll, I'll keep turning things over to you.
Brandon. Uh, hi, Christina. Um, yeah, I had some, I had questions regarding the uh, like you know the the immigrant community's participation in uh, uh, you know Brantford's like various churches. You had mentioned earlier that uh, many of the uh, Chinese residents had uh, self-identified as Presbyterian. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was curious. Um, you know, uh, you know, any other like really you know fascinating stories of involvement of like uh, you know the Chinese communities you know with the you know Presbyterian churches or if they had like set up their own like you know Chinese language Presbyterian churches. Oh yes, yeah. um, There was a local Chinese uh, man, Christian. Um, he was sent back to China to um, work as a missionary in China. Yeah. A church in Brantford sponsored him to go back to China yeah, to work as a missionary. So, and Brantford also sent a lot of missionaries to to China too. So I think it kind of went back and forth. Um, yeah, I, I think most people don't realize that um, the early Chinese community in Brantford were mostly Christians, and um, the residents of Brantford also didn't realize that these were Christians. Harry Chong. The man who married the Irish girl, he was a Christian. Um, so um, he, um, a pastor of his local church uh, married the couple. And um, of course, later situations change. Elaine had a question. and also... Yes, there are more questions in the room, but I do want to get to the one question here in the, the sure. Q&A for you. Um, Christina, this question comes from Judith Nicholson. She's from Laurier Waterloo Campus. Yeah. Um, and she's asking, she thought it was a fantastic talk. Okay. She really enjoyed it. Um, but she's curious if any of these immigrant uh, groups, the Armenians, the Italians, and the Chinese, if there's any kind of evidence of them inter interacting with local indigenous communities in and around Bradford. Um, yes. Um, There's a fascinating story uh, that of, of a Chinese medical doctor. So this is actually after 1920. But uh, this doctor, it was a famous Chinese medical doctor who was a deputy health minister in China and a representative of um, or a Chinese representative at World Health Organization. Um, he happened to be in New York City when China uh, or when the communists won the civil war. Instead of going back to China, he came to Canada because Canada was home of Norman Bethune and he really uh, respected the man. He um, came to Canada. He was, of, of course, highly qualified as a medical doctor. Canada didn't recognize his medical degree, uh, sent him back to U of T to study two, for two more years to get his certificate. And after he finished his um, education, um, he couldn't find a job because nobody wanted to see a Chinese doctor. So making the long story short, what he ended up doing, by the way, his name is Dr. Thomas Chang. He served indigenous communities all across Canada, uh, setting up field hospitals for indigenous communities. And later uh, he became the chief medical doctor at um, Bush Reagan's Lady Wellington Hospital and worked there until um, the hospital closed down. So Yes, there um, were connections between uh, immigrant communities and indigenous communities. And the story of Evelyn Johnson too, right? Evelyn Johnson was from Six Nations. And um, the Wongs had a very good relationship um, with the Johnson family too. So um, there's more to be discovered, but yes, certainly there are lots of uh, stories that talk about the connections between these immigrant communities and indigenous communities. It's fascinating. There's yeah. some more questions in the audience. Um, Blaine, do you want to go first? Thanks, Christina. That was great. Two questions on the, the Chinese community. The first is actually pretty specific. I've seen the family name Mar in, in a lot of North American Chinese, and I'm, I don't know what the, the Chinese name is, and I couldn't read it. Ma. It's Ma. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was, but I didn't know. Okay. And the second was um, the demographic split uh, in uh, in Bramford. The, the typical uh, perception is it was mostly men. 
But is this a, a community where there are more Chinese women actually in Brantford? Um, initially, they were mostly men, but um, somehow they also managed to bring their women. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was it was of course very very difficult, very difficult. But I think by um, like the Wongs, right? Obviously, they have family. Um, I don't know how they came to Brantford and had two lovely boys. Um, but clearly, some people managed to bring their women. Thanks, Christina. It was a, a really interesting and, and um, thought-provoking talk in terms of getting us to think kind of at a local level and seeing, I'm wondering whether you can see also national patterns. So kind of building on Lane's question, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you, if in identifying these families um, and identifying these people, whether you noticed uh, parallels with sort of the larger trends in Canadian immigration. So in the Exclusion Act, obviously, it yes. makes it very difficult or right. does make it all the more remarkable that there are these reunifications of families, right? right? Um, and that the picture of the, the couple getting married was pretty, right. pretty spectacular, I would think, in that respect. So I'm wondering if Brantford's some kind of outlier and separate or distinct from, or or do you have any sense of whether there was sort of chain migration of um, uh, Chinese Canadians from, say, British Columbia, settling into central Canada, right. you know, whether you're noticing any patterns like that that might correspond with the sort of larger trends that we would expect uh, you know, as Chinese Canadians are responding to their very restrictionist mm -hmm. immigration policies and and mm -hmm. and racist pressures that they were confronting in various parts of Canada. Mm -hmm. I think it follows the general national pattern of um, migration. Um, many people came through, of course, the West Coast because that's where it, where it all started, and then kind of trickling down to uh, Ontario, um, to cities like Toronto, and later to Brantford. And they moved a lot. We have families coming from Toronto to Brantford and from Brantford moving back to Toronto, from Brantford moving uh, back to uh, BC. So Dick Marr later moved back to Vancouver or moved to Vancouver. And there's a whole article about him leaving uh, Brantford because he was such a notable figure in, in the community. And um, the article says he's moving to Vancouver to help the Nationalist League there because Vancouver had a bigger Chinese nationalist league and needed support. Um, Italians, many of them came through the U.S. as was the pattern um, generally in Canada. Ar the Armenians' migration, I think, was somewhat unique because a Brentford <laughs> uh, factory, right, or a company, actively went to Armenia to recruit workers and brought them to uh, Brentford. So, yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, Christina. It was really very great. Actually, I, I wanted to ask you about the waves of Armenian immigration in Brentford, because that would be uh, probably associated with atrocities that started happening, right, right. not in Armenia, but in on the territory of the Ottoman Empire. Yes, absolutely. Right. So um, what kind of years? So when when it done? Um, years. <laughs> Waves. I can't tell you the exact years now, but whenever something happened there was a big migration and the expositor will talk about, oh, yet again, you know, hundred and something Armenians are coming because of uh, the massacre that's happening in this particular city, um, right? Um, Brantfordians were very much interested in, in um, what was happening to Armenians uh, in the Ottoman Empire. So, so many articles about uh, not only um, the Armenians in Brantford, but just Armenia, Armenian community all over the world, whether it's in the U.S. or or throughout Canada. So, yeah, I cannot. I'm sorry, I can't tell you the exact uh, years, but if, if if you really want to know, I could go ahead. Yes, right. Um, all these waves of uh, people coming in. 
Um, Christina, I have a, actually a few questions for you. Okay. Um, I mentioned, I, I noticed early on in your presentation, you had some numbers um, of the, well, the number of immigrants in the city, and they seem to kind of grow and then fall and then grow and then fall. Is that just kind of a faultiness in being able to capture the number of people each year, or is there an actual sort of out-migration and in-migration? Out-migration and in-migration, right? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, for instance, uh, the Turks, um, the numbers really dropped um, when World War I happened, right? When things were not very good, to, uh, uh, turning out very uh, good for them. And um, we do see waves of migration, people coming in and then, and then leaving. Um, and that's what happened to, for example, the Jewish community in Brentford. Brentford used to have a really vibrant and strong Jewish community. Like over 50% of downtown businesses were Jewish owned. Zero. Where did they go? They moved out of Brantford uh, when the industry went down. So, and what I also find interesting interviewing uh, various community members is, especially the Chinese community, they thought they were the first generation Chinese immigrants in the city. And I told them, no, you actually go way, way back to 1885. And because immigration came in waves, and sometimes there was a gap between this different generation. Um, oftentimes, Chinese people in Brantford thought they were the first Chinese. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes and sir. I want to follow up similarly. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit of a, a nerd for stats. Um, but I noticed it was either 16 or 17. It looked like about 800 people had left. Was that as a result of the war? Or do you know exactly what happened during that, that year where about 800 immigrants seemed to have left the city or at least weren't captured in the statistics? 1916, you said? I think so. It was 16 or 17. 16 or 17. Exactly. Uh, what do you think happened? Um, I think after the war, uh, maybe the industry suffered or, or the changed its, its focus. And um, Brentford's industry also evolved over time, right? Mm -hmm. So from like agricultural machinery to other things. And as uh, industry evolved, um, the workers also um, changed too. Um, I will have to look into that. But mm -hmm. after the First World War and after the Second World War, there's a huge uh, change in demographics. People just um, packed up and left or um, returned to their old country or uh, moved to other cities in Canada for, for better opportunities. Do you have things? You have a question. <laughs> the other thing that really struck me was this the story of the was it the cockshut company that goes to Armenia. It was that was the company, right? Yeah. That sort of recruits from there. I wonder if you have any sense of why in particular they would have gone to Armenia. And I'm, I was thinking here the parallel with the Arab American community in Dearborn, Michigan, where Henry Ford goes and there's this huge rec recruitment of uh, that community in the Middle East into Dearborn, Michigan. And you know today it's still, I think the largest Arab American concentration of Arab Americans in, in the entire country is mm -hmm. in Dearborn. And it starts way back in this industrial era of, Henry Ford recruiting, particularly for his factories in that right. particular community. I can't, I can't remember now why exactly he went, right. to, or you know, or his officials went to to that part of the world in order to recruit. But do you have, a, do you have know why or what in particular about Armenia attracted, and and was there a difficulty in attracting local people to do the work? Like, was there a need to actually, uh, was there a shortage of labor that would have required them to? to recruit from outside Canada for, for the work? From what I know, um, the member of the Kokshat family happened to be in Constantinople, um, not to recruit. Um, it was just, um, I don't know the exact reason why. Yeah, I just, just happened to be there and saw some Armenians and they seem to be hardworking people and said, why don't you guys come along? Uh, and 10 people came. And these 
10 people worked very, very hard and um, golf shops were impre impressed and that led to this chain migration. So that's that's an, an interesting parallel that we see with uh, the board. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I have a suspicion that because, again, that's why I was asking about the waves, right? The atrocities start uh, in late 70s. Uh, and uh, if this is uh, 1880s, then that's when uh, it kind of, uh, it, it goes up. It goes right? up. And, right. and then if, uh, and again, this is the territory that used to be Armenia, Western right. Armenia, but now it is part of the Ottoman Empire, Empire right, right, right. So, uh, and, and then uh, if there were uh, people witnessing right. the atrocities, right. I think uh, it's the benefit of uh, saving people, bringing them over, uh, yeah. saving them from uh, atrocities. Right. Uh, and, and it seems similar to Georgetown boys, right? right There's right. just similar kind of context uh, in uh, 1950, after right. 1915. Yes, thank you for that. Lots of questions. Well, thank you for all your questions. <laughs> it just uh, made me reflect how uh, you talk, which was superb, made me reflect on Joy Parr's work on, uh, on um, Paris and Hanover. And she pointed out that, that uh, Paris gets a very large British female population because the <clears throat> industrialists there had links with the knitting industry right. in Britain. And so he, he, again, it was a personal link. The same in Hanover, there were uh, furniture producers from Kitchener who moved up into Hanover and they had these links into the parts of Germany where there was fine wordworking. And so uh, what you're talking about, I think it's probably quite a widespread pattern. Uh, right. Just a suggestion. Right. Yeah. The Armenian community, the, religiously, were they Armenian Orthodox? Did they have their own church? Yes, um, there were Christians, and that's why, um, or that's what, that's why, that, well, that was one of the reasons why Benfordians were really interested in saving these Christian Armenians from the Ottomans. These are Christian brothers and sisters. We have to save them. A lot of churches got involved. Um, Christine, I wonder if you could speak a bit more to the Branford Expositor, and perhaps not so much the history of it, but I've noticed that Branford um, history faculty members have made use of the Expositor in the past, even before the project that you've been working on. Um, I know Peter has used it for his work during the First World War. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's been digitized or made available so much earlier than some of these newspapers that are now coming online. Um, I'm curious if you can speak at all to that that work that's been done on making the expositor digitally available and presumably also text searchable. Okay, so when I first uh, started this project, the expositor was not digitized. So I sent my assistants to the public library. They were going through microfiche, trying to find articles. It was so slow, it was just not working. And then halfway through my project, newspapers.com uploaded the entire digitized collection of the expositor and that just changed the game um, because we could keyword search the articles. Um, so yeah, it wasn't digitized. Yeah, it's, it's only a very, fairly recent thing. We're looking at two years ago that um, the whole collection became available on newspapers.com. Brantford Public Library as well, they, they tried for many years to get funding to digitize the collection. It's just too expensive. Um, they can't, they just didn't have the support to do that. And the Expositor was one of the major newspapers um, in, in Canada back in the days. Lots of wonderful articles, not just local news, but international news. Um, so we are, I'm, I'm very grateful that newspapers.com uh, decided to upload the entire collection, which which makes study of uh, Brantford's history, I guess, uh, more 
uh, easier for for researchers who uh, who want to look into these uh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, I can I can attest to newspapers.com is a real game changer. Yeah, it's a game changer <laughs> for sure. Right? For historical researchers, yes. absolutely. Um, are there any other questions in the audience? I do have a few more, but I don't want to uh, to take too too much time. Yes. Hello again. Uh, really fantastic talk. I'm really glad I was able to come here tonight. Um, yeah, I had a bit of a question regarding like the relations like between these uh, different immigrant communities because I know you had mentioned earlier that like you know, there was like, you know, uh, Canadian workers that gotten injured and like the Armenian community, like, you know, pitched in to help take care of them and their family. Um, I was wondering if there was any like um, interactions like that, you know, between like the Chinese and Armenian communities, like, you know, say during the, you know, waves of refugees coming from, you know, results of the massacres in the Ottoman Empire, or was there, you know, any noted Armenian support towards, you know, say like, you know, Branford's, uh, you know, national, you know, its own Chinese Nationalist League. Um, did you notice anything like that? Mm, not necessarily between Armenians and the Chinese, but um, a lot between Armenians and Italians and Hungarians, people who worked in factories. Mm, yeah, this, I think the Chinese entrepreneurs belong to like, a different social, social economic class um, once they start opening restaurants. Um, of course, not all Chinese people were um, restaurant owners. They were restaurant workers too. But yes, definitely more connections between industrial workers. Um, another question from the audience on Zoom okay. uh, to you, Christina. Um, are there still these immigrant communities, the Italians, Armenians, and Chinese in Brantford today? Yes. Yes, uh, we have a huge Italian community, um, also a very big Armenian community. Chinese community uh, is still very small, um, but we have some families who have been in Brantford for five generations. Um, and they kept their dialect, uh, which is really, really impressive. I, I find that um, the very early immigrant families and to keep their dialect for, for a longer time. So this one particular Chinese family that now owns uh, the Oriental Restaurant in downtown Brantford, they've been in Brantford for five generations and they speak Toisan dialect. They come from the Toisan area of uh, the Canton province or Guangzhou province. They still speak that, but they don't speak Cantonese or Mandarin. They speak Toisan. Right, um, because that's what they speak. Very, very impressive. Um, could you speak to those three, like just phenomenal photographs, the negatives? Right. Um, how they were found, like how they came to you in a bit more detail. Okay. They were terrific. Those were terrific. They were terrific photos. Yeah. photos. Okay. So, um, I don't know the exact details, but what I know is there was one photo or photography shop that um, had a lot of, um, well, but that, okay. So there was an old building that used to be used as a photography shop. And when the building was sold, like, people didn't really know what was in the building. And when um, there was, uh, the family was renovating, they found piles of glass negatives in the, in the bay, buried in the, in the basement. And they dug them out, didn't know what to do, um, donated them to the museum. And the museum started, um, I guess, developing some of these glass negatives one by one. They have hundreds of these, and most of them are European um, descents, right, of, of uh, uh, members of Brantford. And uh, it just so happened that uh, the curator there found three uh, photos of Chinese residents, two boys and uh, their mother. And they were the family that owned and operated a Patricia Cafe. I was I was like blown away when I saw those photos. I'm like, oh my god! You know, such high resolution photo of those early residents. They're very, very, very rare. 
Well, they, they, they really are beautiful photographs. Yeah, that's beautiful photographs. Um, I have a question. It's a specific one about the uh, Boston Chinese Cafe. Sure. Why was it called, why did they decide to choose to call it Boston? Is there a connection there? I think they just use the uh, names of American cities, like Hollywood Cafe, Boston Chinese Cafe. Um, maybe because there was bigger Chinese community in these American cities, whether it's Boston, um, San Francisco, or LA. Um, and many of these restaurants um, maybe borrowed um, or, or had inspirations from these really fancy restaurants in American cities. Maybe, I don't know. I, I never interviewed Stigma. I have no idea why he named this Cafe Boston Chinese Cafe. But uh, these names appear a lot. Patricia, they, they didn't have Chinese names. Patricia Cafe, Dominion Cafe, Royal Cafe, Hollywood Cafe, and the name list goes on. I think we have time for probably two more questions. I have one more question. I don't see any more um, on the Q&A, but is there anyone here in the audience that uh, wants to ask one more question before I ask mine? So I try to finish my lecture on time because Blaine told me that he has to leave at eight o'clock. So, <laughs> and now he's still here. Okay, I'll ask, I'll ask mine then. Um, Christina, you're a, a Korean historian, and you seem to, over the past few years, dabbled a bit more in Canadian history. Okay. Are you going to continue to dabble in Canadian history, or are you going to go back to Korean history after that? I, I do not just Korean, but East Asian, right? So right. Korean and, and Chinese. Um, I think I will continue to dabble with uh, <laughs> Canadian <laughs> history. It's been a fascinating journey, um, especially for me personally, learning about Brentford's Chinese community um, and their history has been a big eye opener. I had no idea that Brentford used to have a Chinese nationalist league. You know how how awesome is that? Um, all these untapped stories, I think, need to be uh, discovered. And I will continue my journey and continue to dabble. Uh, and uh, hopefully, one day, write a book about Brentford's. Chinese community, right? That's on my list of to do things on my wish list. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> as you go through that journey of writing the book. Yes. And we also look forward to having you back here again when that book is published. Oh, uh, it'll be much. a lot of fun. So let's uh, give Christina another round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Um, well, thanks everyone for um, for tuning in tonight, whether on Zoom or coming here in person. It's always great to see people um, here in person, um, but also for those tuning in on Zoom that maybe can't make it here in person, it's it's also great to see you. Um, we actually have one final event. This is our last one uh, in the Winter Speaker Series. Uh, Barrington Walker from here again at Wilfrid Laurier University is going to be speaking on a landmark legal case, R versus RDS in Canada, and putting that in the context of Black Canadian history. Um, I believe it's March 22nd at 7 p.m. if I'm uh, correct. I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure it is. If you are interested in tuning in, please go to our website for those on Zoom. Uh, you'll be directed immediately after this webinar uh, to the landing page of our speaker series. You can register there. Um, for those in person, just keep an eye out on our website, even out in the hallway. Uh, there's a poster for you to, uh, you can, there's a QR code on there and you can write down the, the, date, the dates and times. So, uh, thanks again for tuning in. It's again lovely to see you all and uh, hopefully we'll see you again for our last event in March. Have a good rest of your night.